Good afternoon, buena, buenos dias, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair and Miami City Ballet, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Tony Bentley in conversation with Lourdes Lopez and moderated by Stephen Caras to discuss Saranaid, a Balanchine story published by our friends at Pantheon Books. Tony Bentley danced with George Balanchine's New York City Ballet for 10 years. She is the author of five books, all named Notable by the New York Times, which include Winter Season, a dancer's journal, Holding On to the Air, Costumes by Karinska, Sisters of Salome, and The Surrender, an erotic memoir. Bentley is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and her work has appeared in Best American Essays as well as in many periodicals. Also joining us this afternoon is Lourdes Lopez, born in Havana, Cuba in 1958 and raised in Miami. Lourdes Lopez has become one of the ballet world's most prominent and accomplished contributors. She became artistic director of Miami City Ballet in 2012 bringing with her a nearly 40-year career in dance, television, teaching, and arts management. Lopez was the first and only Latina principal dancer with the New York City Ballet Company, from which she retired in 1997. She's also served as executive director of the George Balanchine Foundation, co-founded Morphosis with Christopher Wielden, and was elected to the Ford Foundation's Board of Trustees marking the first time an artist was elected to serve on its board. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Stephen Karras, who performed with the New York City Ballet Company for 14 years, simultaneously cultivating his added gift as a photographer at Balanchine's enthusiastic encouragement. Today, Karras is regarded as one of the most prolific photographers of dance in the genre's history. He continues to photograph, lecture, and guest teach nationwide, concurrently completing his autobiography. Just a quick reminder that throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and please order your copy of Saranad from Books and Books and support independent bookstores. You can just oh. click on the green button below and we will send it off to you or come by any of our stores and pick up a copy there. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Thank you, Christina, for that wonderful introduction and hello to my colleagues from many years ago from the same generation, although I'll always be the oldest one. Tony, um, the book, your book, is poetically illuminating, to say the least. I adored it. You expose yourself, your heart and soul, the way you always have, <laughs> from when you developed as a dancer, through your time developing as a young woman, utilizing Serenade, George Balanchine's first ballet on American dancers, as a theme, a running theme. You part dissect it, you part stage it. At the same time, adding great, uh, new to me in many cases, historical moments leading up to Balanchine's time, hundreds of years before, to his pr prolific career and through to the present. So congratulations on this beautiful book. And I'll show everybody what it looks like so you know what to buy. Can you see this? Okay, and inside, how beautiful. This lovely, of course, pink. It had to be pink. But equal opportunity, it's blue and pink, guys and gals. You both had similar, Lourdes and Tony, you both had similar short and winding roads on your way to Balanchine's official school for his company, the School of American Ballet. Tony from Bristol to North Carolina to the school, Lourdes from Cuba to Miami to the Joffrey School to the School of American Ballet. A question for you both. First, Tony, and I'll read a quote. 
I was 11 years old, and after a number of years of not very serious, once a week ballet lessons, I had suddenly been accepted into the elite pool of young girls from which the best dancers in the world were chosen. Tony, what, if anything, did you know about School of American Ballet at your 11 young years? And what was their assessment of you when you finally auditioned? And Lourdes, you'll get the same question. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I am so particularly delighted to be with my um, my friends and my peers and my colleagues from New York City Ballet. Lourdes and I were roommates on tour. Um, Steve kept uh, the entire company laughing nonstop, which we needed. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Um, <laughs> Um, so in answer to that, when I first, uh, when I auditioned for the School of American Ballet, I was um, almost 11 years old and uh, strange as it may sound, I had never heard of it and I had never heard of Balanchine and my mother hadn't either. Um, though that is very rarely the case, was rarely the case then and certainly isn't now probably. Um, uh, my family had moved to New York City. I've been taking kind of a once a week ballet class. I was not determined to be a ballerina, none of that. Uh, I thought ballet was for little girls like me. Um, and the only ballet I'd seen was the Royal Ballet. So I was kind of a Fontaine Nureyev uh, mm -hmm. fan. But uh, my mother heard from somebody in the laundry room in our building that there was this school um, on the uh, Upper West Side. They'd moved to the Giard building then. And so I went to audition there. And I mean, really, one could say I didn't, we didn't know what we're getting into. And they accepted me the first day. They, they sort of, you know, I was 10. They lifted my leg. I was the right size. And, and, you know, everything looked good. And they were very pleased. But within six months, Diana Adams, the, the great Balanchine ballerina, and at the time of the head of the school, she called my mother and she said, we are worried about her feet. And this, this was really the beginning of me becoming a, a real dancer because I seemed to operate a lot on science. I didn't have dreams of, you know, a tutu ballerina land. None of that uh, meant anything to me. But when I was told I might fail, then the uh, fire was lit on me. And um, I went from kind of the bottom of the class, you know, consolidating at age 10, 11, to, you know, one of the few that were chosen for the company, you know, by the age of uh, 17. So uh, that's what Beautiful. happened. Beautiful. Lourdes, what about your journey to SAB? Well, uh, first of all, as Tony said, and Stephen, as you said, also so beautifully, it's wonderful to somehow be, well, Stephen, you and I reconnect all the time because Miami City Ballet is at the crevice uh, four or five times a year. So we've become, Tony, so you know, Stephen and I have somehow reconnected again, um, but it's really wonderful to see you and to see your face and to read about all your successes. Uh, very, really, truly well-deserved. And thank you for um, holding, you know, flying the Balanchine flag and the ballet flag so high. Um, my uh, journey into the School of American Ballet was really due to, I would say, my mother, number one, who had heard of Balanchine in Cuba and had heard of uh, uh, certainly the School of American Ballet and this great choreographer, including Stravinsky. She'd never seen any of his works, but she understood um, that there was this genius in the United States, um, and that was in Cuba. But what had happened is at the age of 10, I was in... Um, I had just gone to the Joffrey. I'd come to New York just to take a class uh, and spend some time with my father and my family, my, my sister and my mother who were traveling in New York. And I came here, you know, just with them. Uh, my mother put me in, into the Joffrey School. They gave me a scholarship right away. And so we actually stayed. We were only supposed to be in New York for a week, but we actually stayed the entire summer to take class there. I then flew to New to California because my oldest sister Barbara was getting married and took with Irina Kosmovska. Stephen, I'm sure you remember her from School of American Ballet. I took with her too, yeah. Right. So Irina saw me at the age of 10. She called the School of American Ballet. She said, You have to see Lourdes. You've got to audition her. Um, the following summer, I sent obviously the photographs. And I remember you have to do it in first position and in fifth position and a tongue to the side. And I sent it in. I wasn't supposed to get in because the summer courses, they only let uh, students in from 12 up. And I was 11, but I was immediately given a scholarship. And so that at, in 1969 was my first year, my first summer course with the School of American Ballet at the old building at 83rd and Broadway um, with, you know, t you know, to me. And, and I don't remember Diana. I remember Diana a, a few a year later. Okay. But I, 
to me and Stuart and, and all the great teachers. No warnings about body parts. No, I had a, I had a number on my all summer long for the five weeks. I had a number on my pin to my leotard, which was a number 11. I do remember that Balanchine, I do remember that he came in to see group level one. I, I saw he was sitting down with Madame Glebov and someone said that's George Balanchine, the director of the school. Nothing to do with the company. I mean, I had no idea that there was even a company. Um, so, but that I remember distinctly, but that was so, at least that's what was told to me. I didn't, you know, they, I'm sure they had reservations about me too, but none that I heard of yet. Not like mine. I was chubby and old, but I showed good movement quality. That was my assessment. Um, the two of you, so basically you were introduced to Serenade by learning it in the student workshop through Suki Shore, former principal dancer with the New York City Ballet, and now a very important school teacher at SAB. How did you respond, both of you, Tony first physically, uh, to, to, to having this sensible movement come into your body as a young, young dancer? Well, uh, yes, and I write about this in the book. Um, I guess we, we, in, we must have learned Serenade at the same time. I think it was 1974, Lourdes. Um, uh, my cat is trying to participate, so I'm going to just do this. Okay, Lucy, say hi, and now sh I'm going to, you know, sorry about that. Um, uh, that, um, uh, yes, it was 1974. I was 16. She came. Uh, we were, cho I had never seen Serenade. I don't think I'd ever seen the company. Um, and sh I remember the rehearsals. I write about, you know, her placing the big girls in the back first and then more and more. And I was a small girl. And so I was like very last to be placed. I went through the, the terror of like, I'm not in it. I'm going to be an understudy. And then I got to be one of the two very front small girls, which is the same kind, same role. I ended up dancing in the company for all those years as well. Um, and of course, you know, there's this astonishing moment where she tells, she puts you where you are in this very unusual position where each girl is visible. We're not in front of each other. We're each in the space in front of the two girls behind. So Balanchine took these 17 girls, which famously is all he had that day. I mean, imagine how different Serenade would have been if he'd had 16 that day. He'd have done a different formation. And that formation, the opening, you know, with the arm up that is so famous and breathtaking to this day, um, uh, might have been different. Um, mm -hmm. Such is genius, you know, making a ballet. Um, and, uh, and there we all stood like that, the 17 of us. And then she told us to stand in parallel. And of course, it, we spent our entire lives trying not to be parallel, which is a natural human stance of the hips, the feet and the legs facing forward. And we trained, of course, in turnout, the great kind of core of classical ballet that makes it different from every other art form that we are turned out and we are turned out from the hip sockets, not just the feet. Sure. And she told us then in Serenade to stand in parallel, which I remember thinking was very strange. We'd never been told to ask, asked to do that before. And also it was a little hard to balance with our feet straight forward. We were so used to planting them. You know, we were at the 180 you know, um, past the original like 90 degrees of Louis the 14th and um, put her arm up and there it was. I mean, yeah. I feel like, you know, that uh, I, you know, in hindsight that I was kind of born to Balanchine's world in that moment. Right. I don't think anybody else other than a dancer can relate to falling off balance when parallel. Lourdes, tell me, tell us. Well, I had a very similar experience as Tony it was 74, and it was really the first time um, that a Balanchine work had been set on the, on students at the School of American Ballet. It was a, we were the first year, and it was it was Serenade, False Fantasy, and Stars and Stripes, and I was in all three. Um, Suki, I was the middle girl in the middle of Serenade, and um, oh, you were the, the the diamond, the center girl. And, I'm an, and, a, and a similar to you, Tony, I ended up doing that spot when I got into the company in the core as well. Uh, I had a very similar experience as Tony. I sat there in, in parallel, um, but then I started thinking, "Wow, the minute I turn out, all of a sudden I become a dancer." Was and mm -hmm. I didn't think at the time that he might have that he did that uh, for a reason. I just, I remember thinking I'm in parallel, it doesn't, it feels odd, but the minute I turn out into first position, I've become a dancer. 
Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's interesting to me about Dune Serenade that year, along with Danilova's Sleeping Beauty, and then along with these other works, is that there was no difference. It was, it was, I, and I think, I think it's there when I started to have a sense that his, his work was rooted in classical ballet, right? Mm -hmm. And so it just felt familiar, at least for me, it felt familiar right away, but I had never seen Serenade. I had no idea why does this woman fall down? Why does, you know, why are they letting their hair down? I had zero, but somehow it just became part of, at least I can't speak for everybody, but it became part of my DNA of just being at the School of American Ballet. As Tony expresses uh, so similarly regarding DNA, and that's for both of you an understatement. Um, did either of you have a teacher at the school that you, I know Tony's, did you that you especially related to that looked after you more more so than others, Tony? Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't say she necessarily looked after me more. They all had an enormous um, impression. Just to to tell the audience, we were all privileged to be at the school when there were still all these. Um, dancers, Russian dancers, who'd come out alongside Balanchine, not necessarily specifically with him, but most of our teachers until the next generation, beginning kind of with Suki, that were his American trained dancers started teaching. So we had Antonina Tomkovsky, Helene Dudin, Alexandra Danilova, Filia Dubrovska, and these were women who carried an entire world with them. They carried the world of Diaghilev, of, of uh, their training in Leningrad and St. Petersburg, where um, Tamara Karsavina and Anna Pavlova came from, and then eventually them and George Balanchine, so that history was just flowing through them, um, along with their fantastic outfits. Um, when I write about, in particular, um, in my book is uh, Madame Danilova, who was incredible. She specifically taught us, um, for me in any way, mostly variations class where she would teach us petit pas um, variations, but she was a magnificent creature. She, at the age in her, into her 70s and probably 80s, I'm not sure exactly when she stopped teaching, but she was, you know, old when she was uh, my teacher and our teacher. And she did full eyelashes, she did full makeup. She did the, you know, the kind of gray blue lines. Her hair was gorgeous. She had outfits all dyed to match. She had the leotard, the skirt, which very notably was um, with a belt in her like little cinched waist, even at that age. And then the front of the skirt was very short. So you could see her gorgeous, particularly famous legs all the way up to the summit, even when she was well into her seventies. And then it draped in the back. And then she always had a matching handkerchief that she would tuck in into her um, uh, belt and at any given moment she would just pick it out and it would you know match everything would be pink or yellow or blue and it would um, and she just wave it about or she'd drop it on the floor to show us how to pick something up i mean this woman was something beyond style and the the um along with the particulars that she taught us of, of variations in ballet was her example i think that doesn't happen so much now she's so embodied uh, self-respect and, and and confidence and a sense of her own beauty and her own value. Um, and I remember in particular, m many things she said, she spoke with this very, you know, um, defined accent. And uh, one of the things I remember that has stayed with me my whole life is she said, and this was a woman, um, she was Balanchine's second wife um, of the five. And uh, many, and I think at least one other Italian husband and many probably lovers in between. And she said, you know, dears, the, 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 uh, the men, they will come and go, but you will always have your work. Mm -hmm. And that has stayed with me. Living know. proof, living proof watching her. Yeah. Uh, Lourdes, that was, I mean, I love, love your details, all the more so in the book, plug, plug. Um, Lourdes. Tell us about a teacher that you especially took to or took to you. Um, I think they all had their, um, I think they all had their thing to teach us. Right? I think what I took from all of them, and I, and I was particularly close to Madame Danilova as, as well. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up um, actually doing some performances in Baltimore, Maryland, Baltimore, because of Madame Danilova with, with Peter uh, mm -hmm. Martin, believe it or not, at the age of 15. 
but I think what I took from all of them was their devotion, number one, to ballet, right? Ballet was their life, married or not. Ballet was their life. It was it was a religion, religion mm -hmm. for them. Their devotion to Mr. Balanchine, right? Because they all came from different places, but they all revered him as as the thing to look towards. And and even though they didn't teach like him at all, and I don't think he wanted them to, they understood that everybody was on the same path towards Mr. B. Um, and then I also think a respect for uh, the environment, right? And to, and I'm sure Tony, this is the same with you. To this day, I have to dress up to go in to take a rehearsal to teach a class. I cannot walk in like a schlep. I can't do it. And I think that came from seeing Madame Danilova, Madame Tumkovsky, Madame Dubrovska, Madame Stewart, Stanley. Oh, yeah. It really came from Balanchine, who never, yeah. ever, no matter how yes. old or tired he was, the, the yeah. two of you know this, he walked in fully dressed, right, and prepared and ready to go. Um, he never crossed the stage with his shoes. It was it was just total respect for everyone who was in the art form and who was working there to put this art form up up where it should be, right, in his mind. Right. And that's what I, I think that's what I really took Sure, walked sure. away from that that really impacted me and his respect for every physical inch of the environment as well we were told as young boys at the school do not wear jeans backstage you know it was a, even if we were supers extras in in works before we got in the company tony during the french renaissance court dancing of the 16th century when dance was a necessity as you say for a young nobleman to be polished Oh my goodness, the history. Thank you, Louis XIV, for taking it so seriously at age six, dot, dot, dot. The details in the book are phenomenal. So much I didn't know about. Um, what timing, by the way, his legitimizing it, but especially for guys. Um, 200 years later, enter Taglioni. Tell us about her epic contribution that many don't know about. Yes, yes. Well, um, you should just jump back for a second. Um, sure. Ballet history is really only about 450 years old, which <laughs> was remembering that that's a very young art. Think of poetry, think of uh, writing, think of sculpture, think of painting. These go back, you know, pretty much to Adam and Eve. Okay, it's a very young art. Now, dancing of any sort, I'm sure, has been happening since the beginning of time. But if this codified art form that is so precise and so particular began with Louis XIV, as you say, who took classes himself and was apparently an extremely good dancer by every report. Uh, for 20 years, he danced every day, starting at age six. And he was the first one who wanted the art form codified. And his um, his teacher and someone he danced with on stage, which was very rare for royalty on the stage to mix with someone who wasn't royalty, was Pierre Beauchamp, who is a name not that well known in the dance right. world. He's the one who defined the five positions from whence the entire art comes, you know, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth positions. Right. Um, uh, and and uh, and it wrote it all down, and so from that and uh, came the art form, and also Louis. It's worth mentioning started the first national ballet school in history, which has eventually morphed into what is the Paris Opera Ballet now. Right. Now Taglioni, as you say, two hundred years later, um, to those who heard Marie Taglioni, she was a um, uh, part Italian, part Swedish um, dancer, mostly thought of as Italian. Um, and her father was her uh, was her teacher and a very tough one. But what is very notable and interesting about her is while her name is is maybe quite known and mostly one sees this idea of these lithographs of her dancing on literally what they made in the lithograph like a point is that she was the first ballerina to take ballet onto point, which is the other kind of cornerstone of the art besides turnout that we talked about. Um, and uh, she did it in shoes I'm sure that none of us could stand on. They were just heavily darned. They didn't have the block support that we have now. But um, uh, what? It, so she is remembered as like the first sylph and this floating, ethereal, inhuman, unattainable woman. This is the image of Taglioni. And what is really interesting to me um, is that, and, and her training was like 10 hours a day, it was beyond anything 
you can imagine. But she also had a real life and was a real flesh and blood woman. She had um, uh, quite a few lovers. She, one of her, uh, she had, she was given by lovers four different um, palazzos on the Grand Canal in um, Venice, which as I write by today's standards would make her the best paid, probably even beyond Nureyev in his day, the best paid, uh, ballet dancer who are we are known for not being you know well paid um and she at one point married one of her daughters off to one of her lovers um and she wrote a diary so um she was a very smart businesswoman and she had a real life aside from her life you know in the lithograph on her points um and it's thanks to her uh really that the entire art form rose up and became the beginning it was the beginning of ballet being a truly female art which of course you know balanchine and petit pot took further and further along mm -hmm. tony you said she took point from a trick into a language all its own and then some it's so interesting the details about this lourdes we all have early memories of what mr b um singled us out for in class let's mm -hmm. say early on what was he insistent? And let's be short with these answers because I've got more to cover and I want everybody to hear everything. Um, what what was the thing he you felt he wanted most from you that you had the most trouble getting to him? Um, yeah, there are actually two things. And I when I first got into the company, I, I just found this book about a year ago. Um, I would keep I would keep what he said, or I would wrote down what he said in class every day. I wrote it down in these books and this these. Um, so with me, there were two things. Number one, he kept saying fuego, mas fuego, which means more fire. So he wanted me to kind of push beyond what I could do and or what I was doing and kind of just become much more alive. Uh, I would say exaggerated, but much more alive on stage. And the other is I was slow. I was I was just my legs were slow. And he he had no shame in telling me that. He said, do you know what Lords means in French? Lord. And I said, no. And he said, it means heavy legs. And he didn't mean thick in terms of weight. He meant slow. They were lazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and wow. so those were. Sounds the, right. I mean, it sounds like him. It sounds like him. But guess <laughs> what? He, he yeah. knows. Guess what? He made a difference. He and knew. He was at a point in his life when the day he recognized how valuable time was, that's the day he started chasing it. And that was long before we met him. Um, yeah, Tony, wh where I did you- I think we lost Tony, Stephen, sorry. Tony, are you within reach? Can you hear me? There yes, you are. I, I Welcome back. Is that, wait, you're gone again, Tony. <laughs> oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, sorry. <laughs> We've lost yeah, the author. So yeah, yeah. Let's, oh. let's see if wow. she rejoins. It's her, it's her Wi-Fi, I think. She's trying to get back on. Okay. Well, so why don't me, you continue the conversation? Yep, we'll continue. Lourdes, um, yeah, he took me aside one day when I thought I did the step so well. He took me aside and he thought this was the funniest thing in the world to make me laugh. Of course, I went to church the next day. He said, dear, if it were 1940, you'd be soloist. <laughs> so I said, oh, thanks to myself. 35 years to catch up. All right, uh, moving on, um, and I'll save these questions I have for Tony until she's back. Um, as an artistic director, Lourdes, yourself, 10 years, bravo to you. Do we Are we allowed to say bravo or does it have to be an O for everything now? No, you can Come say it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. As an artistic director yourself, and Tony, we'll backtrack after I get this question. Can you hear us, Tony? Ah, uh, can you see me? I think I'm back. Okay, you are. We hear you. Tony. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, I, I'm not sure what it was, but here I am. Okay, I'm asking Lourdes as an artistic director now, um, you're, you're not just teaching steps anymore. You are responsible for the outcome of the work, the company's budget, all, all sorts of things. And related to that, there are designs that come in for certain new ballets costumes, scenery, you'll see them on paper, you'll have to trust it. And then any sort of an oh my God experience uh, with what being discreet, of course, what what showed up versus what was expected? 
There, there are so many. Oh my God, <laughs> there's okay, so. Okay, well we won't we won't delve then. No, we, there. Listen, um, of course there are, but it's part of it's part of the risk that you have to take as an artistic director, kind of push the art form forward. Not everything George Balanchine did or Jerome Robbins did was great. There are a lot of things that were not great that we're just not seeing now. Um, right. Balanchine was a genius, and 465 of his ballad ballets that he's choreographed, 80 of them are still in. Um, or, you know, 75 plus of those ballets are still in ballet companies around the world. But right. he's a genius, right? He's he's a genius. And he also gave opportunities to uh, dancers who were interested in choreographing and lesser choreographers. He gave them an opportunity. He was incredibly generous Very with his theater, so. with his dancers, with his music, with his wardrobe staff to oh, yeah. push and take, and take a chance. And so we that watched, is... Yeah, we watched it in the Stravinsky Festival, 50 years ago. Tony, tell us about the evolution of the look of Serenade. I was stunned to read what you shared in the book with regard to close but no cigar times how many years? Yes, well, um, uh, in 1934, when it was first put on, they were just in sort of tunics. And basically, to encapsulate what is known, what is so famous now is the look of Serenade, along with everything else. The um, kind of classical uh, uh, tulle um, skirt and then a simple bodice in a kind of a pale um, serenade blue, I would I call it. Um, uh, and then the lighting kind of corresponds up into a kind of nighttime bluish uh, lighting that varies depending what's going on. But the ballet in the course of time had different uh, designers and all of them now look look beyond ridiculous. There were short skirts, there were long skirts, there were diaphanous skirts, there were uh, two-toned, what looked to be white and black, there was braids in the hair. In Paris, they wore um, like uh, diadems and, and veils, uh, and little short skirts, all of which is unimaginable now, given mm -hmm. that Serenade looks like it was born into the great Madame Karinska's costumes, but they only came, the costumes only happened in 1952. So for almost 20 years, the ballet was kind of searching for its apparel, as I said. Amazing. As I said. Amazing. Um, and then, and now, you know, it, um, uh, it, it is, how could it be anything else? Yes. Now, how could it? Well, this is all via a man who, when he joined with the Ballet Russo Monte Carlo at 20, 21 years old, he made a comment relating to this somewhat, Matisse, who's Matisse? Which comes in your book via his reaction to certain designs of, of scenery and costume as well. So it's kind of surprising. He, he said something like, I don't get my ideas from looking at paintings. He was, he was direct with what he didn't want in his early 20s. This man was not shy. Yeah. The costumes, the scenery, and then fast forward, we're in, we're in the United States in 1934, 35, and it took all those years for Serenade to get it right. It's interesting. Lourdes, you, you were um, in his first masterpiece, Apollo, in a, as a principal dancer, arguably the hardest of the three ballerina roles. Um, how did he, uh, how did his treatment of you, and briefly, because we're, we're running out of time now, um, how did his treatment of you evolve as you rose the ladder to soloist and eventually principal? Trust you um, more? Was he? No, I don't. Th I, I think curious. what maybe he might have. He it was just because I started getting a lot a lot of ballets from um, the casting me in a lot. Mm -hmm. It was always the same. He was a real gentleman, but he he didn't hide behind the truth. If it wasn't what if it wasn't what he wanted, he would tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that in some roles, like violin concerto, he was, um, I would say he was a little bit more careful with me because I think he understood that that was just this major step for me and was more interested in not scaring Lourdes and wanting to see what Lourdes was going to do with it. Um, but he was there to teach you. And if you weren't willing to learn, there is no reason for you to be there. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting because we all thought that the stars had a, a, a different sort of relationship with him, but it was a teacher is a teacher is fully honest and out there for all to experience. Tony, 
he said something to you in class that really concerned you to the point where you made a visit to his yeah. office. <laughs> Those visits that I'm sure we all had where you realized you had to say something to Mr. B and went and knocked on his office door. Pretty petrified, yes. He said to me in class one day, um, I was doing an arabesque, I think, in the center of the room. He said, you know, dear, if you want to dance Giselle, you can go across the plaza. And you see that expression? It was petrifying. So what he meant by that was, of course, that if I went to dance Giselle, I could go over across the plaza, meaning to the Metropolitan Opera where American Ballet Theater dances Giselle. But the, but, but we don't dance Giselle. We are not at the Giselle company. And um, he was kind of known for not, uh, sort of, uh, I think it was probably more complex in real life, but he didn't like Giselle. And he referred to this virus called Giselleitis. Now, I think he probably, my best guess is that he said this to me. You two would have seen me at that age. But uh, amongst a, a lot of us striving for perfection, I was very, very perfect uh, in a way that kept me back. I mean, I absolutely see that now. And, and, and I was terrified of making a mistake. So I was maybe had a more square arabesque than a Balanchine arabesque all the way out there. And my hair was always perfect and my outfit was perfect. Now, we all sort of did that. But I think, and, you know, he's a master psychologist. He could see you do a plie or walk into class and he knew about you. Um, and while I did not want to dance Giselle, I think probably coming from my early Margot Fontaine years of thinking that the Royal Ballet was what ballet was, was showing. So I went to his office, knocked on the door, um, petrified because I had to tell him that this was not the case. I did not want to dance Giselle. Um, Lot. I might have even had my hair over my ears like Giselle. I don't know. Um, I had a lot of wacky hairdos in those days. Um, so uh, I still do. And um, uh, I knocked on his door. He said, oh, come in, dear. Very calm, clear desk. No, no, no must or fuss. He said, sit down. And he crossed his hand. And he looked at me opposite him in a chair. And he said, yes, dear. How can I help you? And I said, well, Mr. B, you know, I really don't want to doubt Giselle. And that was about the end of it. He said, oh, he clapped his hands. He says, good. I just needed to know that. And then we talked about a few other things that ended up with me um, admitting that I like champagne. And he was extremely approving of that. Gave me a kiss on the forehead and sent me on my way. So. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. What a relief. And that's an understatement. Um, I love the way you say in your book in Serenade, the ladies being granddaughters of the willies and the sylphs. You know, it's just so profoundly described. I'm not saying it right. Now men, not the ladies, are imprisoned, you say, which is so poignant. And uh, I, I understand it so well. I mean, the way you described it was, was fantastic. Um, and that, that journey if you will, for as usual, a man's world, look how long it took, you know, 200 years after, you know, is 200 years later, Taglioni legitimizes it. But I'd like to, you know, since we're going to have questions soon, I, I'd like to um, jump to the final questions for the two of you. Both of you, I think we all have regrets regarding we expected him to live forever, and he promised he would. Remember when those yogurt commercials were saying, you know, the Russians eat yogurt and we live forever, or 100 years or something? He promised he'd live forever. He knew how afraid we were. Any regrets of what you didn't say, Lourdes, to Mr. B? Um, I regret that I didn't, I think, that similar to Tony, just fear of fear of Mr. B, right? Fear of, of, of either bothering him or saying the wrong thing, that I didn't talk to him more. He would often say in class, you know, dear, come, come and ask me. Come upstairs and ask me. You don't have to pay $10 for my class. Um, mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't do it um, that often. When I did speak to him, and there were a couple of times, um, Boy, I have to tell you, I mean, including one in the hospital in Europe, um, when I got in, uh, he was, like Tony said, he was just a master psychologist. He knew me better than I knew myself. Um, and I, at least with me, he was always just, um, it's, they were parables, you know, just things that he said that were short, precise, that I still remember and that I still live my life by. How beautiful. And Tony visited him in the hospital as well. Um, and he said, ah, the writer, when she came in. And he recommended 
write about a man and a woman, a man and two women, a man and three women. I mean, how divine uh, to to have experienced this. A service to Mr. B. So there it is. I wrote about a man and two, three, four, and in Sarah Nod, 20 women. Yeah. Beautiful. Lourdes, do you remember your interaction with him in the hospital? Uh, yes, I do. In fact, um, he asked, he, he, he knew, I mean, I, I expected him because we had heard the stories. I expected him to be in and out mentally, but he knew, you know, he said, oh, dear Lord, this, um, and he asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm actually doing tomorrow. I'll be doing the, the, my first time in the Waltz section of symphony of uh, suite number three. Mm -hmm. And, and he said, beautiful. And I said, well, I really don't know what to do with it. Cause no one's been rehearsing me. And he said, nothing to do with it. Just dance it. Uh, so, yeah. Sounds you know, just sounds, like him. Sounds just like him. Um, Tony, of all the books you've written, and they're all beautiful in each and every way, different. Uh, was this the longest uh, effort um, as far as emotionally? The biggest effort, I should say. I know it took a long time. Is uh, this the hardest one? Maybe the most rewarding? Well, uh, the... That I can't speak to because it's so newly birthed. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I don't want to put a superlative one way or the other, but yes, this book did begin, the idea for it began in 2007. So it is 15 years since then. I did not work on it all that time. It started out very briefly as a kind of, I thought I would do a biography of the ballet with a more of an, a kind of an academic idea. But because I'm such a personal writer, I've now written, I don't know, of, of all my books, three or so, including this one, are some or all memoir. Um, I obviously, my 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 unconscious refused to write um, some uh, an academic book, and also my great <laughs> horror for myself reading and for propagating, as Lourdes talks about, the art of ballet are boring ballet books, and they're quite uh, they're quite prolific. So um, I didn't want to do that. So now I can't speak to my own book now, but I, so I ended up um, changing publishers. It was originally at Yale University Press, which would have dictated more a more kind of historic thing. And I ended up, uh, long story short, I had to break through and write the book I wanted to write. And this, the, the delay there was having, feeling the confidence and feeling adequate enough, which I still don't, but pushing through that anyway, um, to write about Balanchine and one of his greatest masterpieces. It's like writing about King Lear. So one is who, I don't care who's writing about King Lear, you are by definition not adequate. However, maybe you push forward anyway. So it was quite, um, it was very, very difficult. I wrote the equivalent of a, a very long diary about why I can't write this book. And what I actually think now, it's still coming to me because the book is only now just out of my hands, you know, out there in the world and away from me that um, it does occur to me that my endless reticence and sense of inadequacy was really um, not wanting to deal with my grief. And I have to just say, you know, I was very, I make this very clear in the book, I was not chummy chummy with Balanchine. I was one of the last girls he chose and had about six short conversations like we prefer to with him. But he created my entire life, my world to this day. I think I wasn't even aware because, you know, it's been 40, 39 years just on April 30th that he's been dead. And I still couldn't really deal with having this enormous love that is unlike for any other normal human being. I mean, there's certainly part father, you know, paternal there, but it's so much bigger than that, as you both know, because he was a great, great artist and, uh, and provided all of us. Certainly, I feel like he made me into a bigger, better, more beautiful person, physically, morally, spiritually, um, in every way he um, infused me and my and, and created an entire world, everything we've talked about, the discipline, the devotion. Um, so I think I wasn't ready to deal with it until I was. And mm -hmm. so then I, you know, just last few years actually finished it. Beautiful. On that touching note, will you please read for us in closing before we open to questions, paragraphs one and three 
from page 241, which I thought might be perfect. 41. Sure. 241, paragraph yeah. one and three. Okay. Well, one in the middle, I'm a little loath to skip, but let's see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very long. long to do. I know, I know you're editing. No suggestion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so just as a very quick setup, this is after the, the curtain comes down on the end of the ballet, which is extremely beautiful. Um, there are six kind of handmaiden girls on parallel tiptoes with their arms up and going back. And on at the end is the waltz girl, kind of the great heroine, or whatever you want to call it, um, her um, on the shoulders. So she's very, very, very high up on the shoulders of two men with a third man holding her as she leans forward and, and bends back in a kind of a sense of offering or sacrifice or, you know, et cetera. And it's one of the many mysteries in the ballet of what is going on. So, um, so where do we go in Serenade's final diagonal to where the light goes, to where it comes from? And the beauty, our plebeian princess, who was thrice lost, takes us there. This is, after all, where we all first stood where I stood when I was 16. The cycle completes, continues. We began the ballet shielding ourselves from the light and end by going into that light, becoming light. The journey of the dancer, the story of woman, all women, any woman. Mr. B gave us a little thing like that, he called it. Freed in our final incarnation from the exigencies of romance is our central drama. The men come, the men go, we remain, we press forward. We dance for dance's sake. We are but artists, first and last. Balanchine released us into the great wide fullness of female anarchy, our highest expression. His revolution was total, if lightly disguised inside a disciplined aristocratic art that brings us back to its birth father, Louis XIV. Radical to the core, Balanchine was that fearless in his love for us, for woman. You may or may not believe in heaven. I doubt I do, but I went there once. In Serenade, we are dancing for Mr. B at the pearly gates, his angels, ghosts, fairies, sylphs. Psyche reunited with her beloved Cupid. We are American girls learning to dance, recapitulating the origins of the very art we practice. We are not in a metaphorical heaven, but a real one. The only real heaven is the one that is here, now. We dance it here for you, while we dance it there with him, watching, leaning as he did, night after night after night on his right elbow in the front wing of eternity. Beautiful. Oh, hold on. Wow. Uh, in the front wing of eternity of the vast here and now overseeing a dance in the moonlight. Thank you. Wow, too. thank you so much. What a great conversation. So I know there are a lot of people with us watching. So I am going to open the chat just in case they want to shout out to you for any reason and just remind everyone that they can post the questions here at the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And we do have a few questions. So let's get started. So Tony, was there a significant difference between the teaching of Madame Danilova, Russian, and Diana Adams, American? Balanchine was able to synthesize both national characters. Yes, one could actually say he did that. Um, yes, as Lourdes said earlier, the teaching of Madame Danilova, Madame Dabraska, Madame Tchaikovsky, Dudin, uh, Stewart, they all were very, weren't were like a Balanchine class at all. Um, they could be incredibly hard, uh, incredibly hard. Oh my God, Tchaikovsky's classes, you just couldn't even breathe. Um, compl complicated, but they made us strong. They taught us the basics. They were fantastic. Um, I think I only ever had one class from Diana Adams. And I remember when that happened, somebody what, didn't show up for class. Somebody was ill. And I remember she, she ran the school and I remember she came in, in 
what I think we would have called culottes and some soft ballet slippers. She was just grabbing something and she walked in and said, okay, I'm teaching class. Oh my God, it makes my heart beat now. It was so terrifying. Um, uh, but yes, Balanchine took all of that training that he had had and our Russian teachers had and he streamlined it. I think that's the easiest way to say it. He, um, he sped it up for the 20th century and the 21st century. Everything got much, much faster. And, uh, you know, of course, out of, in the ballets, he took out the mime, he took out the props, he took out the wings, he took out all the hoo-ha around us. So we were just beautiful dancers, male and female, moving in space to incredible music. And, of course, he used wonderful music in the uh, 19th century for Tchaikovsky. A lot of the music was what one might call second rate. But then once we got Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky, Ravel, Balanchine used symphonic music. So the whole art form was kind of raised to a new level. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So here's a question for Ms. Lopez. Did your mother hear about Balanchine from Alicia Alonso, who had performed with Mr. B before the revolution during her New York years? Um, Christina, I don't know where my mother heard it from. I, I don't believe so. She had seen Alonso dance a lot in Cuba when she was younger and knew of Alonso, um, but I can't say that she would have heard from, she had no personal connection yeah. to that dancer. Thank you. So um, a question about writing the book. What is the hardest part of writing a book? Of writing any book? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's what it says. Um, well, it really gets into the weeds. Um, you know, depending on what it is, if it's an essay or a book, it can vary enormously. Um, there is uh, so much involved. Um, the hardest part, the hardest part is dealing with oneself and one's demons. Um, yes, because when you write and you put it on the page, I don't know why this happens, but it's kind of, I'm certainly not unique to me. Many writers have written about it. Um, your kind of what Jung would have called your shadow self, your critical self, your censors, your whole life is kind of on the line. And, um, and sometimes it's extremely painful. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, but then there's also, you know, when the floodgates open and it's just flowing out, um, you know, the best times are when I read some odd sentence or paragraph of mine and, and somewhere and don't realize it's by me. And I think, oh, that's quite good. And then I realize, oh, I wrote it. It always surprises me. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, there's, 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 you know, benefits too. And of course, as a, as a, I kept it, started writing as a, with a voluminous diary when I was about 16 years old and that, and that turned into my first book, Winter Season. And I think um, one of the things that appeals to me greatly about uh, writing in absolute opposition to dancing is that to some extent, or, you know, it, it, it's outside of yourself and it will be there when you're gone, you know? So I, um, uh, they're like my children, my books. Thank you. Um, so here's a question from Barbara Thompson. Having had the pleasure of lighting Serenade, I am impressed with the ethereal play between dancer and light in the work, whether the dancers are aware of it or not. Was it originally a part of the teaching of the piece or in Balanchine's thinking about Sarana? Uh, who, who is that for? That is for, I think it's for all of you. I think it's for whoever wants to take it, I think. Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump in there. I, I think um, I think Balanchine uh, like he he tinkered with he tinkered with his ballets very little, right? Um, I mean, he would change choreography for some dancers where he felt one step might suit them better or not. He wasn't he wasn't so enamored of his work that he it had to be exactly the same all the time. And I think that was certainly for me, the beauty and the freedom of dancing for him it could be my interpretation of his steps. And if I changed a little bit, he just wanted to see what Lourdes was gonna do with it. But I do believe that in terms as technology and lighting got, got better, I think, I think those lightings with his, with whether it's um, Ronald Bates, who was his great 
lighting designer for many, many years and from, you know, masterpieces. But I'm sure as the lighting got better and the stagecraft got better, technology got better, that lighting changed. It's hard for me to believe that in 1934, you could have that type of spotlight or um, or the way that um, that beautiful passage at the very end that took that Tony described of the ballerina up on on the, on the shoulders of the three men moving and there's a light from the top. That type of technology did not exist in 1934 or 1940. That came years later. So I would think that Balanchine, as a true artist, was constantly making his work better in ways that would allow him to. Mm -hmm. So here is uh, Willie who's saying, hi all, it's Willie, fabulous interview. What do you remember as the most significant part of Mr. B's class? Class? Significant. significant. Class. Well, class. let's define significant. No, I'm kidding. Um, he, he was racing against time from the day I joined, uh, 1969. And it was, as many have referred to it, more a finishing school than a formal class. And no matter how good you were on the way in, you had a lot to learn. It was starting from ground zero yet again. Um, the, the musicality, the rhythm, the rhythm of his tendus, the, the, um, the, the quiet takeoffs and landings, the putting the heel down to get back up in the air, not what people turned that into. Many musicians have said over the years, and I've heard it time and time again, um, when they've seen a Balanchine Ballet for the first time, that is what music would look like if you could see it. So we were spoiled rotten movement wise, you know, but the class, my Lord, depends on the day of the week and what he saw the night before, which is well known and written about, what needed fixing, could have been all day on tendus or on chassis. Thank you. Uh, Lourdes, someone would like to know when Miami City Ballet will be coming to New York City, and are they coming soon? And they're performing uh, Serenade in, in uh, Jacob's Pillow this summer, correct? We are. Yeah. Um, Christina, we, we are, we're in talks about um, uh, specifically going to New York um, to perform, and we would love to bring um, our new Swan Lake by Rutmansky there. Yes, 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 yes. We'll, we'll let you know. We'll let everybody know as soon as that happens. Thank you. So I think we've gotten to all of the questions. There are a number of comments here in the chat thanking you, talking about how what a rich tribute to dance and dancers and choreography. I think everyone's really loving the book. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. It's been a tremendous pleasure to hear you speak. Um, and just to hear all of these stories and get all of this insight um, into this uh, wonderful ballet. Um, thank you so much for being with us. I'll just remind everyone who's watching that the book is available at Books and Books at all of our stores in South Florida. So if you're here in Miami, come by and pick up a copy. We also have signed book plates. So the books are signed. And if you want to order online, just click the green button and we will ship the, the book right out to you. And then just to thank you. Thank you all for supporting independent bookstores. Thank you, Miami City Ballet, for everything that you've done in our community. Thank you, Tony, for an amazing book. Thank you, Stephen, for your wonderful moderator. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. Any last words? I'm proud of my two friends sitting there with me. Keep it up. Christina, thank you very much and congratulations, Tony. Love thank you all. You. Love, love I you love, you. love you, Lourdes, and I love you, Steve. Thank you love so you much. Both. That Lourdes. was awesome. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Have a Bye. great Bye. afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.